Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for attending. Huh? I'm so sorry. I just, <laughs> we have a new sound system, so this is new for us. Hello, can you hear me okay? Awesome. Okay. Thank you all so much for attending Left Bank Books Presents Paul Steinbeck in conversation with Dr. Gerald Early. For all of you here in person, thank you for being here. And thank you for wearing your mask for the duration of the event as well. We really appreciate your support on that front. For those of us, um, for those of you joining us at home, thank you as well. We appreciate your uh, little pixely attendance. Um, you'll be able to participate in the Q&A session as well uh, by typing a comment uh, in the um, comments section of whichever platform you're on. So my name is Evan and I am a bookseller and event host here at Left Bank Books. So in general, tonight's event and any event is only possible because of your support. When you support Left Bank Books, your money goes directly into your local economy. It helps us keep our bookstore open and it also helps keep the streets paved, the parks and libraries funded, uh, so many of the other things that make St. Louis a wonderful place. So thank you for shopping local and for supporting our event. So we are always hard at work, uh, me and Shane, events coordinator back there, uh, but mostly him, uh, planning our entertaining, unique, educational, revolutionary event programming for you all. So we encourage you to check out our event calendar, our website left-bank.com for a full uh, calendar of events and more information on programming for readers of all ages. And now for tonight's event. Paul Steinbeck is Associate Professor of Music at Washington University in St. Louis. He is the author of Message to Our Folks, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, and co-author of Exercises for the Creative Musician. His new book, Sound Experiments, is a groundbreaking study of the trailblazing music of Chicago's Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, AACM, the most influential collective organization in jazz and experimental music. Sound Experiments represents a sonic history spanning six decades that affords insight not only into the individuals, individuals who created this music, but also into an astonishing collective aesthetic. The AACM's compositions broke down barriers between jazz and experimental music and made essential contributions to African-American expression more broadly. Steinbeck shows how the creators of these extraordinary pieces pioneered novel approaches to instrumentation, notation, conducting musical form and technology, creating new soundscapes and contemporary music. Mr. Steinbeck will be in conversation with us tonight, um, along with Dr. Gerald Early. Dr. Early is Chair of African and African American Studies and Professor of English at Washington University. He has written and edited numerous books, including This Is Where I Came In, Black America in the 1960s, and Modern American Culture, which won the 1994 National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism. So please join me in welcoming both of our guests, Paul Steinbeck and Dr. Gerald Early. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Paul, for coming. And thank you, Paul, for inviting me to be your interlocutor for, uh, for this evening. Um, it's one correction I need to make. I'm no longer the chair of African and African American Studies at Washington University. I uh, just wanted to make that small correction. Can you speak a little bit more? To, if you hold it, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I may have a drink. Um, there we go. <laughs> excellent. So I just wanted to make that correction. I no longer, I no longer have that job. Um, so Paul, I've had an uh, opportunity to um, read most of the book and to listen to most of the music. Uh, by your instructions about this. I uh, found the book very rewarding um, and uh, generated several questions and, you know, we can talk and I can pose some questions as you, you can pose some questions for me or for yourself um, and, uh, and everything. But I thought we'd start out with a rather simple question that most authors are asked. Um, could you tell us a bit about how this book, Sound Experiments, came to be, or how it's related to your first book, um, Message to Our Folk? Okay. Uh, so my first book, as you said, uh, Message to Our Folks, is about a group called the Art Ensemble of Chicago, which was really the flagship group of the collective that I'm writing about here, the, the AACM. 
So it just felt like a natural progression after writing about a group that sort of took what the ACM started and sort of, you know, played it out to its fullest. I thought it might be interesting to go back and look at some of the other, you know, peers and collaborators and colleagues and see what they contributed musically and otherwise. So it feels like a natural outgrowth of that first project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are many black musicians in the 1950s and 60s who were playing what could be called experimental music. Um, the recently deceased saxophonist Beryl Sanders was part of the new wave of jazz featured on Impulse Records, for instance, that also featured saxophonist Archie Shepp and was led by the saxophonist John Coltrane. There was Sun Ra and his Myth Science Orchestra. There was pianist Cecil Taylor. There was Ornette Coleman, who played the plastic alto. Um, and there were other musicians, energy music, was one expression of it. I think you talked about um, uh, intensity structures at different points in your book about these high energy moments in the music. There were people like Albert Eiler and Don Cherry, Milford Graves, Sonny Murray, all these people, Marion Brown. In this cosmos of black experimental music, where does a the AACM fit and what distinguished it from these other black experimental musicians? First thing that occurred to me in listening to your question is that all the figures you mentioned were in the by the 1960s based in New York City mm -hmm. or maybe an hour outside or something like that. So just the geographic distance is one. So the AECM was formed in 1965, really at the peak of what people might call you know free jazz, energy music, fire music, all these different mm -hmm. terms which have positive or negative valences depending on who you are. Um, but all this was basically coming out of New York City. Even if you came from Cleveland or Los Angeles or Georgia, you came to New York to sort of do this and be a part of this scene. That's even true of Sun Ra, who had roots in Chicago before leaving around 1960. Mm -hmm. But by the middle of the 60s, you know, everyone was in New York except for this new organization that, that came around. And when you look at uh, the founding of the organization in 1965, um, there's a wonderful book by someone we both know, George Lewis, yeah. who has who was able to go back and listen to the actual tape recordings of the very first meetings. And one of the things they're talking about as they develop the template for this organization was these people were doing one thing in New York and want to do things a little bit differently. There had been a musicians collective called the uh, Jazz Composers Guild mm -hmm. that was around briefly in 1964, and by 1965 it was belly up. There was infighting and conflicts along racial lines and aesthetic conflicts and economic sort of questions. And there are many, many other collectives formed during this period, some like this one in New York and others in many other parts of the country. But just being in Chicago away from some of that New York stuff allowed, I think, people in Chicago to make a critical decisions about how to make this organization operate differently. And one of the things that came from that is that the AACM is the only one of these music collectives from this period that's still around. Mm -hmm. All the others founded either immediately or within a few years, but the AACM is still going. Um, I think the other thing that makes the AACM and its members unique is they had their own musical vision. It was in dialogue with some of these other strings of black experimental music. It was in dialogue with a lot of other things as well, including jazz and including some other stuff. Um, but they really developed an idea together kind of without anybody bothering them, <laughs> both in a positive and negative way. There weren't people beating down their doors to offer, you know, world tours right away, but also it meant they could develop this, you know, musical direction, this kind of hot house environment, be inspirational to one another, support each other, going in very different directions, at the same time be really committed to building this as a collective. So we can get into more detail about some of those musical details that, you know, musical features that makes the AACM stand out. That's kind of what this book tries to do. But just on an organizational level, being in Chicago, a different sort of cultural environment, you know, not caught up in some of the New York opportunities and, you know, and, and potential for a disaster. And they were able to do this on their own in Chicago, you know, in, in kind of just on the south side, which is kind of a city unto itself. So they have the opportunity to develop independently, and they did it, and they're still, they're still doing it. Yeah. We're talking about the different names that this music had, um, energy music and fire. What's your preference? What what would, what do you like calling it? You know, I, I, it's hard to come up with one term, and it, as soon as you come up with one, then the musicians are taking you wrong, or some <laughs> other musician will come wrong and contradict that other musician. So uh, 
uh, the scholar Ronald Redano talks about black experimental music. I think he was the, maybe the person to coin that term in reference to this. But I think the, the ACM has their own term. They call themselves the Association for the Advancement of Creative Music. And so for them, I think that term creative music is really significant. It means, I think, that we're doing something that is based on personal creativity along a couple different dimensions. So um, for context, a lot of the musicians who formed the AACM came from a jazz background. They had been professional musicians or they were you know, too young to be pros, but they wanted to be. That was their career aspiration. But when they came together and discovered they really had kind of a musical vision that was not quite where jazz was at the time, they figured that they had you know, to sort of develop their own direction and then of course develop their own terminology. So one of the things they were committed to as an organization was composing and performing only original music. So from 1965 to the present day, every single concert sponsored by this organization has been original compositions, you know, by ACM members. Um, but also like composition kind of means one thing, like sometimes it means the composer writes a score and then hands it to some musicians and then they have to play it as written and if they don't, you know, they get fined or, or fired or something like that. So bad things can happen if you don't follow what the composer says. One of the things that makes the AACM's brand of music, you know, a little different is that there was an expectation that you would be original as a composer and also original as a performer. So the, these composers built in opportunities throughout all of their pieces virtually for people to improvise and bring their own creative contributions. So I think they developed a vision of music where everyone is going to be creative and whether you're a composer or a performer, you're going to be peers. It was going to be an equal relationship. Everyone was going to be contributing, even if it maybe looked a little bit different in terms of who's sitting where on the stage or who's handing you a score. The idea was based on creativity, and it didn't matter whether you were composing this piece or improvising on it, because when it came to that next concert, concert the next week, then the improviser might become the composer and vice versa. And then the week after that, you would be selling tickets. And the week after that, you would be, as George Lewis remembered, a couple of days when I spoke to him, you'd be cleaning the bathrooms before the concert the next week. So there was, it was a collective project. Everybody had to contribute, and that included sort of all sides of the musical experience. So I think creative music is a term that the AC invented that tries to capture that balance between composition, improvisation, and all those coming together to represent the total, sort of total expression. Yeah, um, I remember in the chapter Wadala Leo Smith. Yes, in that chapter when he was talking about the uh, uh, European music and uh, Black American music, he divided um, music up between classical musicians and creative musicians. He didn't call them jazz musicians, he called them creative musicians. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, you know, that seems uh, to um, very related to your point about. Um, the significance they attach to the word creative. Yeah. Um, yeah, and some of those people that he mentions in that history of creative music would have never probably applied that term themselves. So yeah. it's kind of a revisionist history of Black American creativity and music, but it's another way of asserting yourself as belonging to a tradition yes. that has its own kind of lineage and its own sort of respect, its own place in the culture. He may have done it in a different way and still is doing it in a different way. I heard him in New York last night. He's 81 and it sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another type of longevity that a lot of AC musicians have achieved. But uh, part of that tradition, but also very much about experimenting and branching out. The very first ensemble that sort of gave rise to the AC was called the Experimental Band. They didn't call it Richard Abrams Jazz Ensemble or any of the other sort of things, that terms that were out there in the air. It was experimental from the beginning, definitely belonging to some traditions, but also trying to be, you know, sort of new from the start. Yeah. Um, this the rise of the AACM occurred at the same time as the rise of the Black Arts Movement. Is there some correlation between them or did the AACM see themselves in some way connected to the Black Arts Movement or identify in any way with the Black Arts Movement? Yeah, I think, I think uh, they were very connected and saw themselves as part of that sort of new thing that was bubbling up in the 60s. A lot of historians of the Black Arts Movement dates beginning to 1965 due to you know, what people like Rock were doing in New York. Uh, so this is the same moment. Um, so definitely when you think of black artists of whatever sort of medium, whatever domain, getting together and you know working cooperatively and trying to sort of redefine their art, ACM is very much in that, you know, in that line. 
And they also had relationships with a lot of other black arts movement organizations in Chicago, organizations of painters and sculptors, uh, dancers, people doing all kinds of theater actors and directors. And many, many AC musicians were also active in these areas, putting on sort of happenings or plays or having dancers be part of the performances or being visual art practitioners, uh, several of the musicians, even including the two that are on this slide, have their visual art exhibited in like major museums. So, you know, in, they were individually part of the Black Arts Movement and also the organization as, you know, as a whole was allied with many other organizations in Chicago. Not so much other places in the country that had sort of parallel happenings, but they were very much part of the Chicago Black Arts Movement scene. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Chicago and the and the emphasis you put on the A. <laughs> some, some window display is really doing the most. <laughs> yeah. um, with the AACM and it being rooted in Chicago, being distinct from the people who were doing what they were doing in New York, were, were there any characteristics or anything in your research that you felt about Chicago that made it a special place for these people to be, or something special that supported what they were trying to do? Yeah, I, I think I could think of several things. Um, uh, first of all, many of these musicians who went on to form the AACM were educated in the local public schools, and the South Side in particular was known for having some of the best sort of band and orchestra and choral educators, you know, nationwide. Uh, part of this comes from the sort of inopportunity for talented and highly trained and educated and multiple degree having black musicians to get jobs in orchestras and things like that. So very often education was that next career path. So you see these wonderful world-class musicians as junior high band teachers or high school band teachers. So that aspect of what was happening in Chicago, especially on the South Side, was important. Um, also, Chicago was the home of a lot of other really, really foundational styles of Black American music. I think gospel music is being sort of, as at least as a commercial genre, invented in Chicago. The blues basically moving from Mississippi straight to chess records and places like that on the South Side. Uh, but Chicago was also kind of a weirdly cosmopolitan city. So if you listen to musicians like the ACM composer, Henry Threadgill, he talks about growing up on the South Side, playing for evangelists and doing that sort of church music thing. But he was also gigging with Howlin' Wolf and other blues musicians. And he was working sort of the parade circuit and learning how to play like Polish marches and polkas and stuff like that. You know, and then he, was, he would go downtown to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and hear Fritz Reiner conduct all this great contemporary music. And then you would go to the north side and check out what the experimental theater people were doing or go farther north and listen to the musicians like playing Japanese kabuki music and all these different things. So because of the cosmopolitan nature of Chicago, you could be really, really rooted in the south side and get a great musical education as a young person. But then you could also be exposed to all these other things. And I think you see that with the music of the AACM as a whole. I think you see a grounding in black American musical traditions and also a desire to make contact with all these different global musical forms, many of which were available in Chicago, you know, for these men and women to sort of build into their aesthetic very early on. There's also a, a discussion in AACM circles about, because Chicago wasn't like a big music industry city, like, you know, New York, or New York or LA or Nashville, they didn't have quite the same commercial pressures. You could sort of take time to rehearse because you weren't always running to that next recording session or gig or whatever. And it was also kind of cheap to live there. So you could maybe have a side job or maybe do a few other type of musical gigs and you can still barely pay your rent and then really devote most of your time to doing this new music, you know, sort of breaking new ground. So those are some of the things I think that have been special about Chicago continue to be in some ways, but were definitely true in the 60s. So. Um, there seems to be, um, I'm talking about the AACM and um, what its vision was for um, the, the creative musician. There seemed to be four innovations there, as I understand from reading the book. One was multi-instrumentalism. The other was small instruments, playing small instruments. The other was new ways of notating music. Um, and some people, um, such as Leo Smith or uh, Anthony Braxton, notated music very creatively. Um, and original compositions, the insistence that, uh, of doing original music. Um, I wonder if you could expand a little bit uh, about these innovations and 
why uh, the AACM shaped their identity around them, and how these, um, how you feel these um, innovations might have affected other jazz musicians. Yeah. Okay. I think a lot of these, the, the four things you know, you mentioned uh, multi instrumentalism, smaller little instruments, and then uh, notation. Notation. And then the final one is original music. I think all these go back to that number four, that you know, sort of requirement that everything you do be new music composed by you and you know, your band members. So if we look at something like, I have a couple slides here that may be helpful, but if you look at something like multi-instrumentalism, um, this is kind of a, maybe one type of example. So you see on the left, Roscoe Mitchell with an alto saxophone. He also has a little zither on that bench next to him. Uh, Lester Lash Lashley, the musician in the middle, is playing cello, but he was also playing bass and trombone. And Lester Bowie, who's playing flugelhorn, Lester's from St. Louis, grew up about a mile north of here. Uh, also played trumpet and a bunch of other instruments. So uh, around 1966, a lot of these folks in the AACM were like, it was, it's great to play one instrument, but maybe this and this, and they just kind of, they got on a tear and just started picking up new instruments like every few weeks. If you go back and look at concert programs or flyers from this period, you can see, you know, people asking for donations, like pay a dollar to get in, but pay an extra dollar. And I can use that as a donation to buy this new saxophone that I need, you know? But that comes from original music. It comes from wanting to have all kinds of different sounds in your music. And it's really tough to do that if it's just four of you and you each play one instrument each. And you can get a great sound with that, but you can't get the sort of diversity of expression, you know, that multi-instrumentalism affords you. Um, also, something about something uh, about that sort of little instruments or small instruments, that's kind of the same category, but just a different flavor. This is musicians picking up little percussion instruments, bells, rattles, shakers. And then that's where it starts around 1966. And by the end of the decade, it's just literally anything that can make a noise, you can use that in some hard part of your piece. The composition might be specifically crafted for that, or you might just in the flow of improvising, say, I'm gonna pick up this drum, or I'm gonna go to this vibraphone, or I'm gonna bang on this gong, or I'm gonna just tinkle this little bell one time, or I'm gonna go over here and play these drums, and it just becomes a really, uh, really uh, sort of percussion focused way of building up your instrumental arsenal. So again, this, this movement toward multi-instrumentalism and all these little instruments starts about 1966. You can see like with each new record date, the number of instruments listed on the album cover just keeps going up. And so by the time you get to 1969, uh, Roscoe Mitchell on the left, Lester Bowie on the right, uh, there are several musicians who moved to Paris in 1969. And Roscoe and Lester's group, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, apparently had about 500 musical instruments they took with them. So that's a lot, you know, if you, <laughs> if you think about it. So they took Lester's old VW van and literally just packed it to the gills and like pushed it onto the ferry and then onto the ship and then, you know, drove all the way to, to, to you know, sail all the way to France with that, then unpack some of the stuff so they could get in the driver's seat and drive to Paris. Um, so that just in a few years time, you go from two instruments to nine, to 82 to 500 or something like that. Just absolutely, you got to be like crazy in the best sense to really want to do that and really pull it off. Um, so that's multi-instrumental and little instruments. The third piece you mentioned is notation. So if you're going to mandate that all music that you perform be original, you might find that there is some musical idea you have that can't be represented in conventional notation. And you can't even really describe it just by talking to the musicians. You actually have to sort of make these new symbols. So I have an example of a few of these sort of new type. Now, this is more of a conventional score. So if anybody's ever read music or sung in a choir, you've probably seen, you know, chord notes and eighth notes and things like that. That's kind of hard to play, but it's conventional notation. This is early 70s. But then you get a few years later, and Anthony Braxton is writing scores that look like this that have some conventional notation, but also colors and things that zoom in and zoom out and shapes and alphanumeric codes and all these things tell the musicians to do something, not necessarily one thing, but for instance, you could, if you see somewhere on there that it says like two plus three plus two, and some of those are in parentheses or in boxes, that could tell you do two notes with your main instrument and then three notes on percussion and then sing the next two notes. And that's all the direction you get. But if you're creative improviser, that's all you need. Like that's a lot of possibilities come off that, you know, or because you have that red rhombus 
The Ramas means something. Red means play with intense, explosive emotions, and then go off and play that next part of the mobile or the next few notes that kind of float in the space. So, you know, all this can be explained, but it takes a lot of creativity, both as a composer, to think about it and then as an improviser to kind of to pull it off. Uh, then you have, I think, a very recent piece from Nicole Mitchell. This is from a 2015 suite of hers called Mandola Awakening 2. And we have kind of, again, still more mixtures of, you know, graphics and note names and written instructions. You see kind of about one third of the way down, it says something like this, six, seven, or eight. Like you could count off this rhythmic figure based in percussion, however you want to do it. And whoever comes in first will kind of figure it out. And the next person you come in, you add to that. So being very creative with uses and notation, but all that is just in service of originality and trying to accomplish something you can't quite do without, you know, basically breaking the mold, you know. And then fourth is original music. So all of that comes together under that umbrella of trying to be original and having people support you in that originality, you know. In other environments, if you bring a score like this, people might say, get off the stage, or I'm not rehearsing this. And there are many stories of these sort of things happening, but in an AC environment, people are like, oh, cool. What do we do here? And what instruments do you need me to bring so I can fulfill your vision? So that kind of community spirit, that collaborative attitude helps all this stuff come to fruition. And this leads me to the question about, with this revolution, um, there being a counter-revolution, um, which I'm very curious to know what your opinion is, that with all these instruments that people were playing, that they may be accused of some of them not playing them well, you know, that they weren't virtuosos on all, they couldn't possibly be virtuosos on all these instruments. I remember a conference I had on Miles Davis many years ago, Jackie McLean was one of the speakers, and he made an album with Ornette Coleman, and Ornette Coleman played the trumpet. And people at the conference criticized him for doing that because Ornette, Ornette Coleman was not a trumpeter. And they said, he, how could you do that? And it, um, I remember that McLean, he didn't apologize for it, but he felt um, a little sheepish about it. And so I wanted to ask you about that and about the whole kind of counter-revolution uh, and what your feelings are about that and the accusations that people were not being, were playing instruments that they weren't virtuosos on and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So, I mean, you're absolutely right that you can't play 100 instruments sort of equally well just from a sheer factor of time. Like, what can you really spend time practicing? At the same time, one thing that helped a lot of AAC and multi-instrumentalists is that instead of just playing a saxophone and a bass and a piano, like they would just learn all the saxophones and they're the learning curve is not steel. It's a different mouthpiece with the fingers are the same. And then you can go from there to the flute or to the clarinet or what have you. And because of the sort of school music systems that a lot of these people came up in, you know, you started on clarinet and then you picked up saxophone. So part of that is just how you learn some of these instruments, not all of them, but if you can play one wood, wood, wood when you can probably play another. If you can play one brass instrument, you can probably play another. So, but at the same time, yeah, sometimes you get into territories that are a little more challenging. At the same time, with uh, I think probably the best way to explain this is uh, a poem that Joseph Drama, the ACM member and member of the Art Ensemble, wrote. He has this lovely poem from the 70s where he talks about why must I be a master of anything, you know, whether it's saxophone or clarinet or anything else. And these are instruments that he played very, very well. He said it's also important, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, to have just be able to take the music that's flowing through me and just put it out there. And sometimes it might take hitting a table or it might take, you know, you know, playing a little singing bowl or something like that. You know, and that was all just in service of sort of that creative expression that he felt was part of his other mandate, you know. But many of these musicians were and are incredible virtuosos on a few instruments. And then all that other stuff kind of just supplements, you know. I think it helps that some of the things like the little instruments, small instruments, those percussion, you don't necessarily have to be a master to play a wood block or a little kid squeeze toy or an auga horn or whatever, but it can be used in the music and it's kind of convincing and persuasive in spontaneous ways. But, you know, so there's a rejection within the ACM of the all virtuosity all the time discourse that you get in jazz and classical music and some other spaces. But at the same time, you know, some of these people were really, really excellent and continue to be excellent at, you know, a dozen or a few instruments. And I think that level of virtuosity they achieved maybe insulated them from some types of criticism. Like if you can play saxophone like Russell Mitchell, 
then it probably doesn't bother you that he goes to his percussion cage and hits gongs and little bells and little drums, you know, for an hour. That's that's another facet of his his work. Yeah, I, I was um, I thought that was kind of a subtext in this was um, this um, feeling of anti virtuosity mm -hmm. in jazz, which jazz of course has become a super virtuoso music, and um, I guess the name of that would come to mind about the sort of counter revolution that this would be Wynton Marcellus as someone who certainly is, you know, the believer of super virtuosity. And uh, um, so I, I was just really interested in your opinion about that um, and their philosophy um, um, and going, you know, going against the wave of, um, of this. But um, clearly, if you listen to Joseph Jarman doing uh, his solo saxophone um, piece, um, of course, instantly, you don't even have to be a musician to know that this person is a virtuoso on this instrument. So um, um, do you feel that's necessary for jazz, that jazz needed a push back away from um, um, a, a, a preoccupation with virtuosity? I mean, I think it probably still does because if, you know, if you, I've been, I was in Chicago last week, I listened to one of the jazz stations on the radio, whoever was Whoever the DJ was is playing a lot of Hot Lips page from the 40s and some other stuff. And those guys sound like blues singers, you know, and it was virtuosic in a certain type of way, but it wasn't virtuosic in the way like sort of the top 200 New York jazz musicians right now are, where they just play so many notes and play them so well. You know, jazz had more of a kind of vernacular feel, and that made that's actually part of what made jazz one of the most influential phenomena of the 20th century, music or otherwise. You know, it came from somewhere and it spoke to that somewhere. And many people who weren't necessarily from that somewhere were still attracted to it. And they you know, sort of joined, you know, joined the parade. So, you know, I, I, I'm definitely not in the position of becoming, I, I don't want to be a jazz critic in that sort of way and critique what jazz people are doing. But it, it is kind of, it is kind of odd when you take music through virtuosity, through some of these developments, you know, so far away from what actually was one of the most appealing things about it. This, of course, happens in many other fields of art as well. It's not unique to jazz, not unique to music, but it may be that some of the anti-virtuosity of the attitudes of the ACM sort of resonated across time and space with how people were playing jazz in the 20s and the 30s. I mean, if you look at the drummers of that period, they had wood blocks and cymbals and gongs and all kind of weird and wonderful stuff that you didn't see again until ACM and other drummers in the 60s and 70s, you know, and beyond, you know, so they may have had kind of some kind of spiritual connection to a couple generations before those jazz practitioners, you know, and, and ACM people will tell you about being inspired by it. these people from these people from this period. It was it's not the only thing that inspired them, but they felt like there was a precedent for multi instrumentalism and little instruments and what people were doing in the 20s and 30s. Um. This leads me to another question uh, when you're talking about the original compositions and how and how the compositions were put together. The latitude and range of choices that musicians are given in performing sections of these compositions by the AACM composers leads me to ask if it's possible for the composer to ever object to the way a player chooses to play it. Um, and um, as you noted before, in some bands, and you know, you can talk about Dizzy Gillespie or Charles Mingus or certain famous band leaders who would call you out if you played, uh, if you played it wrong or if you played it in a way they didn't want it played. And um, but if you're given this kind of latitude in playing the music and you have these great range of choices about what you can do and so forth, does it mean that you can never really play anything incorrectly as long as you're playing it? um authentically or what you feel is authentic could a band could a composer ever say oh i don't like the way you played that yeah I, there are a couple different ways to answer that question but i'll probably just do the anecdote method okay. so to give you one story um this is a, a piece by wadada leo smith dedicated to the memory of emmett till uh this is not the story that i'm, that I'm going to tell is not related to this piece but it's something else by wadada so when he was developing his own notation system in the 60s he has a story about uh, being in a, in a room with Anthony Braxton and Leroy Jenkins, and they were all working on his new piece. And back 
back in the day, uh, many of the AAC musicians used these, you know, sort of tape recorders to record rehearsals and concerts they could go back and critique. And so he said that they uh, played this new score of his while they were, while the tape was running. Then they finished the piece, you know, rewound, rewound the tape, played it back, and he said, "I couldn't, I couldn't tell at any at any moment, at any second, what part of the score." Anthony was playing what part of the score Leroy was playing, what part of the score I, I was playing, but it was perfect. At the same time, I've been in other AACM settings, either as a fellow performer or just backstage or in the, in the audience where people have gotten, you know, had some hand to them because they did play, you know, in the way that it needed to be played. So I think it depends on the composer. I think it depends on, on the piece, you know, it depends on the musical situation. Um, I'm not going to mention any names, um, but I, I've definitely seen some stuff that indicates that composers have very, very specific aims. And, you know, as a performer, you should try to align with that. You know, it doesn't always happen, but I think it kind of, I think it kind of depends. Um, there's a, I'll finish up with another anecdote. Uh, there's a story that uh, the pianist Vijay Iyer tells about going on tour with Roscoe Mitchell for the first time. And uh, Roscoe's only instruction to the band was, let's get that note thing going meaning everyone's going to play a lot of notes and we're going to all do it in our own way. But it has to have an overall effect. So if you're playing and I'm just following you, then I'm not doing my job. I'm not developing my independent stream of music. Or if I'm not playing quite enough notes or with enough intensity, then the overall sort of sound mass is going to suffer. And so Vijay had to figure out in practice, you know, from moment to moment what Roscoe meant by that. He said maybe on the second or third day he kind of got it and the music elevated to another level. That's something you can't put on a score, but it's a very specific idea. And Roscoe had a, a direct way of conveying that. It just took Vijay a little while to figure it out, you know. So I think there's all kinds of ways that composers and performers can interact. It has multiple sort of ways it can work even in ACM circles. Sometimes it's very open-ended. Other times, you know, it's very specific. Sometimes it's tied to the notation. Sometimes it's the verbal instruction. So you know, it depends <laughs> to, to restate. Okay. Um, at the conclusion of the book, you um, talked about the new AACM bands, the you know, third, fourth generation people coming along, playing compositions that were created by earlier AACM, AACM uh, composers. And, you know, while this is certainly understandable as a way of paying tribute to the artistic achievements of the AACM, isn't there a danger in going back to the older music of creating a kind of canon? And um, it would seem to me that the AACM, at least as I understand it from your book, philosophically would not really want to create a canon. Yeah, I mean, this is the project called Artifacts by the ensemble of Tamika Reed and Nicole Mitchell and Mike Reed. This is the first time this had happened in the, 50, <laughs> the first 50 years of the ACM. This is kind of a, a tribute they did to the organization for its 50th anniversary. So I'm thinking if it's the only time it's happened in 50 years and seven more years have elapsed and it hasn't happened again, we're probably safe, we're probably out of the woods. They, they made a second album last year and it was, I think there were two pieces by other composers and everything else. The other nine tracks were all original. So even in that one group, I don't think there was any danger, but they wanted to sort of to some of the people who've been mentors and inspirations to them. So it is a little, it is a little odd, but you know, I think it was more of a one-off. That trio still operates, still has this new album out, and now they're back on the original, on the original thing. But I think there kind of is an ACM canon. And another way you might establish an ACM canon is to write a book about you know, 10 compositions recorded by ACM. That's my next question. Okay, all right, all right. So uh, go ahead. <laughs> So guilty as charged, but I'll explain myself in a second. <laughs> so my next question is, you know, doesn't your book yeah. do that in, in selecting these pieces and, um, um, you know, the, the pieces you use, the pieces in number one now is, as, as showing them artistically and so forth and describing, but they become a kind of history of, of, of this organization. Yeah. And uh, so I'm wondering if there is this kind of anti-canon sensibility in the group aren't you as an academic coming in there doing this aren't you canonizing their work i am i am <laughs> however i've talked to a lot of acm members none of them seem to mind it they seem to be actually kind of happy about it so uh if i am then it's i guess it's cool but yeah i don't know it is it's a it's a risk you take anytime you sit down and research and write about something you're gonna put some stuff out there and 
people could maybe draw the conclusion that's that's the only stuff that matters. That's the only stuff that's important. Um, one of the things I try to do in just about every chapter is for every piece or every single composition that's featured in this chapter, I try to point to a bunch of other pieces that are related to it in a certain way, whether it's by the same composer or by the many other AAC members who've worked on exactly that musical direction. So that in itself, to me, is kind of anti-canonic. Yes, this chapter focuses on Braxton's Composition 76 or George Lewis's Voyager, but it comes from a lot of other things, and it still will go off in a lot of other directions after that performance, after that story is completed. So there is a canon aspect to it, but I don't think it's designed to, to have the effect of it being exclusive and shutting down all conversation, you know, inside or outside the ACM circle. And you say that the musicians were were not unhappy with what you were doing. <laughs> so far, I've gotten nothing but positive feedback. I, th I think the thing that was most gratifying was in the chapter where I write about this piece by Wadon Leo Smith. Um, he uh, this piece was particularly important to him personally because he was a young black man growing up in Mississippi when this happened to Emmett Till, and they were basically the same age. Uh, and it happened maybe 20 or 30 miles from his hometown, so it hit as close to home as it could have hit. Um, and so for Wadada, he wanted this piece to be a portrayal, not necessarily of the sort of events that happened on the day when Emmett Till was lynched, but more of Till's state of mind, his psychological sort of response to this event, and even portraying his sort of afterlife when he transitions and all that. And so you know, I, Wadada was gracious enough to send me his massive score for this entire sort of five hour collection of works. I dug into it, fell in love with this particular piece, wrote about it, and sent the draft chapter to Wadada. And I pointed out in that chapter about four moments in the movement that I thought were pretty, pretty crucial. And he, I think, emailed me the next day to say, those are my four favorite moments in the piece too. So I think there's, because I've been around AAC musicians for a long time, over 20 years, because I've had these really productive, collaborative, or just sort of intellectual relationships, I think um, even if there's a canonizing aspect to work like this, I do think that in many cases, I'm fairly in tune with how the music was created and performed and maybe ideally received. And so if, if I'm holding this piece up, I think I'm doing it more or less in a sort of accurate and sensitive way. So that, I think, I'm may help as well. You know, I'm fortunate that many AAC musicians are still very much on the planet, are willing to take my calls and return my emails and texts and all that. And so that helps me, uh, I think, you know, think about this in, you know, in a you know, pretty salutary way. That's good. Um, this piece, this was part of the, a longer, about 14 Freedom Summers, I think? Ten, ten Freedom ten, Summers, yeah. I, I added four pieces to it. That's okay. <laughs> well, it's entirely, it started out as 21 pieces, and then since since its premiere in 2011, he's added several more pieces to it. Every time it gets performed again, he adds a new mm -hmm. piece to it. So it's like, you go, you have to go to the concert hall for three nights in a row. It's about an hour and a half, two hours every night. It's really, really an experience, you know? So, uh, but yeah, this is what Adelio Smith's sort of musical reaction to the movement right. for civil rights in America. Yeah, yeah. Um, who do you feel is the audience for your book, and and uh, what do you hope um, the audience will gain from reading your book? Okay, well, the, we're looking at some audience members right now. We're looking at potential readers right now, um, and so I, I think the this this book tries to be in touch with several different communities. Uh, certainly, the ACM uh, members of the ACM, whether they're whether they get a chapter in the book or they're the 120 ACM members who don't get a chapter in the book, but they're still part of that story. Um, it definitely is written for other like-minded composers and musicians who maybe know a lot of this repertoire, but maybe don't know every piece or maybe don't know the story behind this one particular work. Uh, and then I would say also it's intended for anyone who is curious about music that's kind of off the beaten path and tries to carve its own path. And um, there are some you know, scores and things like that in the book, but you don't have to read music to read the book. Uh, you can go to paulsteinbeck.com slash AV and listen to the music and get into it a little bit and as you read the chapter. So I think it's designed, you know, more, you know, more broadly for anyone who has some kind of interest. I'll, I, I just also add to that that the ACM has had a worldwide audience for a very long time since the late 60s when some of these people first started going to Europe especially and also Japan and 
every other corner of the world by now. And so I wouldn't restrict it to just people in the U.S. or people in Chicago. There's a, I anticipate that there will be, uh, we've already had some reviews and some European publications, and I just anticipate it will be a global audience as well. Okay. Um, so, um, um, I'd like to follow up on that question by asking you about the AACM and um, what audience were they trying to get with their music? Yeah, I think they initially had the hope that they were going to be able to create an audience for kind of cutting edge music on the South side. That didn't happen right away. It probably still hasn't happened in terms of just being a sort of a neighborhood phenomenon. Anytime you're doing something that is really in dialogue with music from all around the world, you probably have to go all around the world. So uh, I think they had it at, you know, one initial aim and it transformed pretty quickly when they started getting notes from, you know, record labels in Chicago and then record labels overseas and then promoters overseas. So I think they realized, at least by the late 60s, early 70s, that this is something that could have global dimensions. So since the late 60s, early 70s, many, many AACM members have been touring the world uh, not 365 days a year. You can go out for a few weeks and do some hits and come on back home and live your life. I was just in Chicago a few days ago and one of the ACM musicians I saw there, you know, say, hey, I just got back from Paris. We did this great show. They loved it. And he was back in Chicago doing what he does as an arts administrator slash performer. So I think there's this, there's a global audience that allows you to kind of actually do the music that you really love, original music, which is I don't care what kind of music it is. If you do the music that you're committed to, then that can be a hard way to make a living. But a lot of ACM members have found a way to do exactly that, having that global buy-in helps, having an audience in the States too. Uh, and then many of these uh, individuals are top-notch educators or have other sort of things they do. Some of us in this room may be students of ACM composers. You know, I know at least one other who's back there. So, you know, uh, so they've built an even larger sort of community that's not just musicians, not just concert promoters and audiences, but also the many, many, you know, students and other people that they've taught and shaped along the way. So that's a really important part of your audience because when you teach someone and they go out into the world as a musician, they kind of take what you what you taught them. And then they actually, by doing what they do, they make the world of music more like what you as an ACM member, you know, are all about. So I think when like when people talk about space exploration, they're can we terraform the moon? Can we terraform Mars? Well, probably not, but good luck. But I think the ACM is kind of like ACM form, a lot of corners of jazz and a lot of corners of experimental music. It, those musical realms do not look like they looked in 1965. Not all of it is due to the ACM, but they have definitely you know, made their mark and, and continue to do so. But the original hope um, was that they would develop a black audience yeah. for this music. Yeah, and I think I th I think part of the reason why they formed was because that audience was at least for jazz was starting to go away due to, due to urban renewal and sixties economics, flat to the suburbs, all kinds of things were going on in the sixties. So the, the jazz scene was kind of dying even as they were forming the ACM. I think they thought, well, if we band together and produce our own concerts and do all these things, maybe we can build back that audience or you know, but they quickly found that there were people on, you know, in sort of black neighborhoods on the south side that were interested. There are also college students at the University of Chicago and critics for Downbeat Magazine, which was and is headquartered in Chicago and, you know, composers on the north side and all that. So I think they, I think their audience pretty quickly looked a little bit different than they had anticipated, sure. but it ended up working out. So, you know, it, uh, it's 57 years later, I think you would yeah. say it worked out. Sure, sure. Um, is there any particular suggestion you have for readers about how to read your book? My own experience, I'm not a musician, and um, um, the, the musical notation, I did not find that off-putting, but I read a lot of books about music, so I'm, I'm not, so that doesn't bother me. I felt it was very helpful about having the music, um, and I would um, read, your description of the music, then I would go listen to the music and go back and read it again. And I found that to be uh, extremely helpful um, and uh, actually very enriching. I don't know if that's how you intended for people to read it, but that's how I read the book. Um, and uh, I thought it was um, 
very generative in, in bringing out things about some of that music I heard before and bringing out things in the music that um, I um, didn't um, know or understand before. And the reason why I ask this question is because this is music that's not um, immediately accessible uh, to people. And I think many people with this type of music feel perplexed. They don't know how to feel about it. Um, and because they aren't really sure what they're listening to, so they don't know how to react to it. So I was just wondering, you know, how do you think that people should read your book and, and, and interact with this music? Well, I think you did it the right way, you know. <laughs> you, you, you got a copy of the book, you read it, you listened, you read some more. You could, I think there are a lot of portions where you can just listen and read at the same time if you are a good multitasker. I'm not, you know, I, don't, I can't speak for you, but I might have to go back and forth, but some people can actually do that, and I've, I've had some feedback that that works for them. Um, but I, I think having that listening component is really, really crucial. I think you're absolutely right that, you know, many people, if they're the first time they're confronted with something they've never heard before or never heard anything quite like before, it can be a little puzzling because music, you know, music uses sound and, and only sound, you know, in some ways. Of course, you know, when you see someone perform, you're seeing someone performing and you can, you touch that key and it makes a sound. So there's a visual and all these other components, but music also exists just purely in sonic space. If you put on a recording, listen to the radio, that's that may be all you have. And if you don't get those cues, like here comes the chorus, or you know the cymbals get crashed and the bass drum gets rolled, or whatever it might be, you may not know what you're dealing with. But I think uh, one of the things that I try to do, and I hope this works for people in addition to yourself, is even though you may have not heard this particular piece. I try to break it down in such a way that it becomes very intuitive. There's not a lot of heavy musical terminology that only a musician, only a composer would understand. So it's it's uh, it's designed to be as accessible as possible, regardless of your level of exposure. And if you find yourself getting into it, then that's that would make me very excited, you know. Because I love the ACM. I wrote a book or two about these these folks, and you know, uh, so I want I want other people basically to have that same experience that I did 20 some years ago never hearing anything like this before, wanting to learn more. And I was able to get some, a lot of teachers from the AACM, composition teachers, bass teachers, all that, you know, but if you didn't have that experience, you can still listen to these pieces and they can become maybe even more compelling than they were on first listen. That, that can be a good way to read slash listen at the same time. My uh, final question for you is, um, You've done two books related to AMCM, one on the art ensemble in this in this book. Um, in looking at a future project, is you still intend to mine the AACM, or you're thinking in the future about doing something doing something different? I think I have at least one more AACM book project in me, and then uh, afterward, I'm gonna probably come to you and get some. You know, get some suggestions, or at least a reading list or something. You know, so we'll see. But I, I think I have at least one more AC book in pipeline, AC related book. So I, I hope you like it, everyone. It's, it's going to be it's going to be even better than this book, and, you, and which is even better than the one before. So you know, better and better. Well, I mean, really, because you know, writing is hard. You have to do it. You have to do it. There's no way to do it other than to do it. You know, you got to write, 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 and write, 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 and then if, once you're done with that, you should write some more. So, you know, practice makes perfect, or at least it helps you improve, you know. So, there will be more good books, including at least one on an ACM figure. Would you like to take a few questions from the audience? Yeah, at least three. Just three to 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that could be virtual audience, it could be in, in person audience. But if anyone around the room has a question, you know, jump in. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Steinbeck, my question was I started reading chapter nine. Okay. The Cole Mitchell Soul. I'm just curious the hurdles he had to go through before he you know, came and they were in five years later. Yeah. Uh, what that kind of story like? I think her story is not the only story that worked out that way. I mean, back in the very early days, if you had a pulse and you loved the music you were in, you know, and then as the organization evolved and it took a few years of becoming known, you know, by the mid 70s, like there's kind of like a vetting process. You had to get recommended by one or two ACM members. You had to be you had to prove that you would work, show up, and you know do all these things and participate. So um, for her, it was definitely not what she anticipated because she was very young when she moved after finish after you know being in college. Very young when she moved to Chicago, she already knew a little bit about the ACM and basically looked them up right away. And she has a story of going to the, like knocking on the organization's door 
in this. Now, we're not taking any new work right now. I just take a lesson or I'm teaching an old student now. <laughs> and then five years later, the same person who was a little brusque with her at that door was the one who recommended her for membership. So there's, you know, many of us know whether it's in music or other fields, sometimes you get, you know, uh, hazed a little bit and there's a process you go through to kind of make it in. Uh, so Nicole Mitchell definitely dealt with that. But now she's probably the leader of the like under 60, under 50, under 40 generation within the AACM. So she was not, you know, off put. She just had to work her way in with some other people. Uh, she also faced an additional sort of barrier because there were very few women in the organization at the particular time she wanted to get in. So, uh, but once she got in and she just brought amazing woman after amazing woman in after her. So now the organization is not quite 50 50, but it looks more like, you know, the South Side looks more like the world. So I think for her, that was one additional layer, but many people have had to kind of go through that process to get in, you know. Uh, and but every few years, there's a new batch to come in, and they, a few years after that, they're, you know, dominating. They're making great albums and giving great performances. So it continues to produce and attract, you know, musicians of really, really high quality, you know, whether they're coming in at 25 or in some cases, you might be 55, 65 joining the AECM, but you've been around, you've sort of shown yourself to be part of that community. And speaking of age, you said in the book that uh, some some of the members reach a kind of peak in their 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, I hope I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, just as, as an example, I mean, the person featured in the person who holding the saxophone here, Roscoe Mitchell, he joined the AECM when he was in his mid-20s in 1965. He just turned 82, and he's still, if you've heard any of the comments he's given lately, he's still a, a beast, you know. Uh, I, I, in the best possible way, Henry Fred Gill, who's on the left here, is, is uh, late 70s, still doing great work. George Lewis just turned, I, I mean, do I have permission to give people's ages? <laughs> yes, that could be in some settings that can be room. George just turned 70. He just took a position as the artistic director of the International Contemporary Ensemble, which is the leading new music organization in the entire US. And he's still composing huge pieces every day. You know, Fred Anderson here was close to 70. He's playing saxophone, close to 70 in this photo. He was he finally got successful when he was in his 60s and became one of the world's most beloved saxophonists in his last two decades. You know, and the list goes on and on. So Anthony Braxton, who's playing, holding the sax on there is still, you know, he just had his 75th couple years ago and we're getting ready to have a big conference in his honor in Germany next year because he's still that dude. So I think there's, honestly, I think there may be a bit of a connection here. Of course, maybe people have health problems or whatever it might be. You can't predict maybe the day on which you make your exit. But if you're involved in something that basically is so rewarding and allows you to fully express yourself, every day, even though there may be some economic dislocations here and there, or there may have been this or that struggle of getting in or whatever it might be, it seems to be endlessly inspiring to a lot of AACM members. So they, to me, one of the reasons, real talk, why some of these folks became my heroes is because I could see myself as a young musician wanting to still be engaged with music and still doing things at a high level, even though I was just a baby, a beginner. When I first met a lot of these people, it just seemed like that was a path it would probably work for me, you know, if I can still be killing it when I'm 72 or 82, that's pretty good. Not, you know, not a lot of people can do that, no matter their profession or their hobby or whatever it might be, but a lot of ACM folks found a way, you know, some of them went out swinging, you know, went out playing a great show a week before they passed. I mean, it's just really, it's really amazing, you know, to see that. It seems like more than a, a coincidence or more than just a series of patterns or whatever. I think these folks are really committed and I think it sustains them in a way that not everything can. Always believe that the best is yet to come. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another person question. Bill, did you, um, you maybe I should give the yeah. microphone to people. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah, yeah we can do that. Uh, we've yeah. unfortunately yeah. just got time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Uh, I'll keep it out of the virtual Let's audience. Let's keep three more. Just three people got hands up. Uh, yeah, I've just been uh, listening to a lot of Mingus lately, and I think it's kind of interesting the way Mingus is generally more associated with like the traditional jazz canon versus the AACM, uh, a lot of like the free modernist experimentalism, and especially like things like Haitian Fight Song or Think of This Erectus are really yeah. weird composition. Yeah. I was just wondering what like the AACM relationship was with Mingus. I'm not sure if it was much of a direct tie, but I think definitely kindred spirits. To me, when I think of Mingus, I think of someone who's taking kind of materials of, of jazz, whether it's Ellington style stuff or Jelly Roll Morton, 
one of my favorite pieces of his is my jelly roll soul. He kills it with that sort of takeoff on jelly roll morning. And then also music of the black church, especially the sanctified of Pentecost church. All these things are in Mingus's music, but he does some really interesting stuff with them, you know. So I think that's an aspect that you see in a lot of ACM, you know, to taking some stuff that maybe even predates, you know, Roscoe Mitchell might like he has from the 60s a version of Oh Susanna, Stephen Foster song from the 19th century. But he completely deconstructs it and turns into something else. So I think there's a definitely willingness to engage with, you know, you know, Roscoe has other pieces that are like he has a, he and the art ensemble did a, a version of a Monte Verdi aria from an early 17th century opera. It's the <laughs> it's one of the best things that anyone has done with Monte Verdi. It sounds like it could have come from his pen, but it's played on different instruments and it has a different spirit to it, but it's it like has that same, you know, uh, emotional impact that good opera does, even good early opera. So I think there's connections to the way that people like me because they were raised up in a tradition and then really made it their own and did some stuff. But you can still hear that. You can still hear the roots in there. Evan, did you say we had a great, a juicy virtual question? <laughs> Let's keep an eye on it. Not any just yet. It's it's so intricate. They're still typing. So. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else in person? Yeah, we got it. Hello. Oh. Use this microphone wisely. Um, would you mind going back to the Emmett Till slide? Yeah, sure. That's right. So I can't read music, and I know a bit about Emmett Till, and I know that what happened to him could not have been fearless, but I see the value in creating music about it that is defiant and fearless and I wondered if you could help me see what it is about this composition and and this music that brings that to life. Yeah so I'm just gonna try to paraphrase what the composer with I Leo Smith um, says about it so uh, again he was same age same everything same quarter of Mississippi when this happened so it hit him personally and so what I felt like he could kind of at least imagine or, or sympathize in, in a really uh, really substantive way about what him, you know, Till went through. So part of what the piece does, it starts with the theme that Wadadi himself plays on Trump. It's designed to be not uh, a portrayal of the tragic thing that happened to him and Till, but actually that lovely studio photograph of him where he's wearing that beautifully knotted tie and nice hat and everything. So this theme is intended to represent like the youthful beauty and, you know, just, you know, going out to the world daring that the young and Till had or must have had. Uh, later you get that same theme played by the cello. This is a piece for kind of a jazz quartet plus a chamber orchestra. So later the that theme is given to the cello. The cello takes it, the cello is one of the most wonderful instruments because it can be super low. Uh, I'm speaking to some people who know what I'm talking about. And it can be super high. And so the cello starts out a little bit low and then it gets higher and higher and higher. And eventually the cello is actually playing higher than all the strings except maybe the first violin. And then it hits this beautiful high harmonic, this soup like the, it's the high, almost the highest note on the piano high. And that moment is like kind of the cusp of Emmett Till transitioning. So you don't necessarily experience all the tragic stuff that he goes through, but you see sort of his personality and his, and his will and his spirit presented initially on trumpet. That's what Dada kind of channeling in and the cello of this instrument, which maybe is even more beautiful. Then after that, then the ensembles that are combined start to play some more tumultuous music. Uh, and, and so what I talks about that as being maybe some of the more you know, brutal aspects of, of what happened in until that day in Mississippi. But it's done with, you know, it doesn't sound hurtful or harmful, it just sounds like a lot is happening. So this is what I just attempt to portray that in a way that was not necessarily um, playing up the, the sort of horror of it, but more talking about what Emmett Till was and what he continued to be, you know, after that event, incident down in Mississippi. So that's probably what, roughly what, what Ladonna says about it. And I think if you listen to the piece, you'll be struck by the beauty of the piece from start to finish, even though there are some moments that are a little bit more chaotic and a little bit more serious. But it does, it's not only heavy. There's a lot of other stuff in there. Yeah, so you've done this amazing job of evoking the musical vision of, of the AACM. So I have a very boring question. 
which is what are, what are kind of the rules and bureaucratic um, principles that have kept this organization together over so many years? And how, like, what would it be like to be a member of the AACM cleaning bathrooms or like, um, invite you know inviting people to the show or what what what's kind of the day-to-day -day boring aspect of the AAC and that that knits all of this together okay so on the bathroom clean question you know <laughs> that's more of the 60s and 70s when they're staging concerts and rented you know you know lodges and places like that kind of that was part of the you know you rent our place you got to clean up after yourself that sort of thing or they had a space at a South Sound Community Center, where it was, they kind of took over the building and made it their headquarters. And so, yeah, they had to clean because that was that was their spot. They were using, it, you know. So it's not quite as gritty now. You might have concerts staged at the University of Chicago or at some theater on in downtown or north side of Chicago. Or there's also a second ACM chapter now in New York, and the New York concerts are held at these very very nice churches and concert halls and places like that. So it's not quite as rough as it used to be. But when you're getting something off the ground, you know every tech mogul can tell you there was a lot of sweat equity at first you know so there was there was that aspect to building up the AACM I think uh now there's an executive board that does a lot of the day-to-day -day administrative work these are all AACM members who are chosen to serve as chair vice chair secretary treasurer publicity manager all those sorts of things um and for the other members they might you know do a lot of their labor labor to produce this or that concert or to, you know produce that event but a lot of times you're left to your own devices it's not a full-time job there is a concern that you know a lot of people are operating on, you know, maybe week to week, month to month, year to year. One of the big things the A team does is a big anniversary festival, especially every five years. They pull out all the stops for that. So those are major, major productions with big time grant funding and all that. They they get grants for other operations too. But back in the you know in the early days, no money, no funding, no anything. So it was pure labor, but a labor of love. All right, thank you everybody for being here. Let's thank our guests one more time. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and move towards our signing portion of the night. If you haven't bought your book yet, race each other to line and do so. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be setting up the back table, um, and you can go ahead and get your books on there. Thank you so much. Paul, how much, uh, how much were they for you? 